we were like preparing to go. I saw this like YouTube video of like these missionaries up in the mountains, and I don't think I think it was in Haiti, like eating like mud pies, and I was like crying. Yeah, I did not want to eat mud pies. <laughs> like I remember, I walked away and I was like. God like answered my prayer like a worth. very black and white like that's an answer from yeah God. after just praying about that you got your pictures you posted your cute, cute moments yeah and you're headed home you, and you yeah, feel you good welcome back to episode two of the sister sip podcast um we had a lot of fun filming and recording the first episode and we had a lot of good feedback from it and you guys seem to really enjoy it so yeah I want to say thank you so much I kind of didn't expect so much love and support yeah it felt really good because it's like kind of scary putting ourselves out yeah. there but we're having so much fun and we just couldn't wait to record another episode our upload schedule might be kind of confusing yeah we're still kind of figuring out what we want to do with it um, we're kind of committing to once a month, every third Thursday, like we said before, but as much as we can, we'd love to sprinkle in some like extra episodes like this one in here and there. Cause we just can't wait a whole month sometimes, but we also want to just take it slow and just have fun with it and not like overdo it. Yeah. And we want to do what we know we have time for. So yeah. that's kind of what our thoughts are on the upload schedule. Today we're going to be talking about kind of a few different things but all around kind of the same topic of kind of missionary life mission trips um we some of you probably already know this but Kinsley and I both lived on the mission field for two years um almost 10 years ago and then we've done little mission trips here and there um, or visited back and forth there so we're just going to kind of share a little bit of our thoughts on that what it was like living in Haiti for two years um and yeah. yeah, and kind of some thoughts on just mission trips, missions all the way around. Yeah, we yeah we have a little bit of experience, so we want to kind of have a little discussion around it, but I'm really excited. First, we have to talk about what we're sipping today because I'm really excited. Let's grab it. Let me see if I can do this without spilling my whole drink this time. So this is something I made. It didn't turn out <laughs> quite what I was thinking. Um, it's still really good. I feel like the flavor, the pumpkin flavor isn't super there, but it's a pumpkin chai latte. So um, I've already kind of tried it a little bit because I want to make sure it was good, but Kinsley's going to go ahead and try it. But it's just a good little fall drink, I guess. Mm. Do you like it? <laughs> I do. That is good. So it's like a pumpkin chai latte. It's super easy to make at home, um, and I'll post the recipe. Fun. But I, I like making a chai latte myself at home if I want one because I find when I go to a coffee shop they always use a concentrate that's way too sweet than what I yeah. like so you can control that way more when you're at home and cheaper too yes yeah, cheaper too and I feel like it tastes so much better than getting mm -hmm. one at, this, at a coffee shop definitely okay yum do you taste the pumpkin really I don't maybe know maybe you could put a little bit more in yeah well like we've mentioned all of our recipes for our drinks are on our Instagram at sister sip podcast so definitely give us a follow if you haven't already and we'll have all of our drink recipes there and thank you so much everyone who has followed us on our account so far I feel like it's been it's been really fun to see the interaction on there and yeah so it just like Kinsley said earlier thank you so much for the support on this podcast so far it's been really fun to see that you yeah. guys enjoy it. I feel like it gives us more confidence going into the second episode yes. it's like oh, people <laughs> actually enjoy this yeah definitely <laughs> all right should we get into what's brewing the segment where we talk about what's been going on in our lives, the thoughts well, we've had, everything, <laughs> before we get into the main topic of the episode. We are leaving for Kansas tomorrow for a wedding. It is Keegan's, it's like where Keegan was from, so we'll go visit all of his family. We're leaving at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. I feel like I have a common theme here of recording these podcast episodes <laughs> before a trip <laughs> before a trip which is yeah great but you know I'm we also have like a 13 hour drive there so I'll have the time to edit and everything yeah. I'm also gonna be recording the wedding ceremony which oh I, really I didn't know that I just found that out 
like yesterday she asked me the bride asked me which i'm not like recording it or like i'm not editing it and making a whole wedding video yeah it's not like a big deal yeah but still like i've never done that i'm hoping that i can capture all good yeah yeah i don't i'm are you worried about the audio and stuff i a little bit i'm i'm using my camera and i have like a little mic on it yeah like she said it was kind of a last minute decision they don't I don't think they have like a videographer or anything yeah so it's just they probably aren't expecting it to be yeah like but I mean I'm thing. kind of yeah hopeful hoping that that will all go yeah. well and that's about it that's my plans <laughs> and I mean we told you guys last time that we went to, to the, the Ozarks which was so fun I mean it was very fun yeah um, super super pretty up there it just kind of like kind of remi- kind of like up in the mountains or hills and by a really pretty lake there's lots of wildlife so that was a really fun mm. relaxing getaway yeah and that was the first time we kind of done a trip as like newly married yeah, couples with our friends so fun. it was so fun like for anyone has kids or anything yeah, yeah. S- like I'm loving living life with other people yeah. in the same stage of yeah, life it's, it's so fun. fun I have different life updates the biggest one we've had um, a bit of a mouse issue Ew. And <laughs> it's been so gross. And I think it's just because we live in an older house and it's yeah. cold outside. So I think they're just starting to come in because I really didn't really notice it at all before the last month. Basically, when we came back from the Ozarks trip, I have a little honey jar on like I have a little cart that I have like coffee and tea stuff on. And there was mouse turd around that. And I was like, Ew, it's disgusting. That <laughs> so I cleaned that up and then I started to find it. Basically, it doesn't get in our cabinets thank goodness yeah but anything that's exposed and not covered it's in there like that it, is disgusting. and I have yeah I found it a lot of different disgusting places or it's just all disgusting everywhere you find it and so we've set oh. out a lot of mouse traps and we have an ant problem but which I was disgusted by but something about a rodent in your house yes. is disgusting and it can just like poop and yeah and I am like and I mm-hmm. yeah and I'd seen him I'd seen one running around and so we've caught I think five so far uh <laughs> Oliver it's not very humane but we just catch him in the <laughs> sticky traps <laughs> but those things are like the only things that work really well I yeah. feel like because like Oliver had read up on it and so when we catch them usually like we'll go to bed and find him in the morning yeah and Oliver loves to feed them to the cats so it's <laughs> kind of like it's kind of good for them, I guess. <laughs> the <laughs> cat the scent and the taste of mouse. Yeah, they need to be doing so, their job a little better, yeah, it sounds like. Yeah, they do, but they're not really inside cats. <laughs> yeah. But one morning, I had found one. We had, like, our little desk or TV cabinet, and we had caught one right there on the corner. And I was like, okay, we caught one. And then I go out to the kitchen, and we have a sticky mouse trap underneath our coffee cart. Well, there was a big mouse on it. <laughs> That normally I don't see because it's under the car. Yeah. But it had like struggled its way out. So it was like right in the middle of the kitchen floor. I was like, Oliver, you've oh, got to And get it was this. like alive. Yeah. I was like, Ew. I'm pretty sure they are all alive when we catch them still. I'm like, you've got to get this cleaned up before I can even start to do anything yes. in the kitchen because I cannot stand to see that. But that the kittens love it. And it's really nice that they just eat them and finish them yes. off. Because I don't want to, I don't know, kind of. I think Oliver, he has a little bit of a tender spot for animals sometimes, too. It's like you'll catch them, but you don't really want to kill them. Yeah, and, and you can't throw them out in the field because they'll just come right back. I mean, mice are, they're kind of cute. Maybe you've, like, lost <sighs> They're the cute until, like, you see them, like, running, running yes, by really quickly. They, you know they're, like, eating your food. Yeah, they creep me out because they're so fast and they're just, like, I don't know, they're little Yeah, legs. they just, like, nibble at everything. And then they leave droppings, like, everywhere where they you basically know that a mouse has gotten into something because it like i guess they just leave droppings i wonder they go do they, they just eat. like i eat and it comes right back I, out that's what i'm <laughs> thinking because it's, <laughs> yeah that was fun do you have any more life updates no okay another big one for us <laughs> is oliver is at home right now working on putting a dishwasher in yay i am so so thankful about oh that my goodness. it's been four and a half I always forget how long we've been married. I think it's been about five months. Five months tomorrow. Okay. And so I've had to wash dishes by hand for five months. I can't imagine. And uh, I didn't hate it at first, really. And it's not that I hate it. It's just that it's so time consuming. Yeah. I basically almost work full time. It's so annoying to like always have that 
<laughs> I mean, it sounds really dramatic, but it's just always like a burden to have yeah. to like, it like takes oh me my so word, yeah. long. It's like, I, it's like, I can't just like clean up real quick and put them in the dishwasher. It's like, I got to go and like hand wash every single dish yeah. that we have. And I know it's the first world problem and not something I need to complain about, but it's, I am just, it's such a blessing that we finally got a dishwasher. And yeah. Do you ever think it's funny? Like, I would have absolutely no idea how to put a dishwasher in. But, like, oh guys word, can just, no. like, figure everything out. I'm like, I, I would be absolutely no. clueless. But, like, he didn't want – I'm like, we could just ask, you know, like, one of your friends. And because, um, you know, someone who has, like, works in plumbing could just do it for yeah. us. And he was like, no, I'll just do He's it just myself. doing – yeah. Yeah. And I'm just I like, know. okay. Keegan's the same way. He just, like, wants to try to do everything himself. Like, he – Watches put YouTube in, videos. Yeah. He put in, like, a faucet for us. Yeah. But – yeah, it kind of blows Basic my mind. stuff like that, I just, yeah, I have no I, idea how to And do. I don't know how anything works. Like, no. I, I, owning a house has helped a little bit. Yeah. Me to gain a tiny bit yeah. of knowledge of how well, things yeah. work. But I'm like, how is he going to remove the cabinet from underneath the countertop and then put the dishwasher in and hook it all <laughs> up? <laughs> Seems like literally, <laughs> Keegan's yeah. laughing. Keegan, you probably know how to do it too. I just think it's like basic stuff like that. I'd be like so scared. Oh my word. Try. I would <laughs> never, you could never catch me yeah. dead attempting that. Yeah. Like, no, no, absolutely not. And I also have one more little life update. It's been really fun. We have a wood stove. In our house. And our house is not heated by that. It's just kind of like an accessory. Um, but all over to the first fire in there. He was Ooh. so excited to get the fire. I bet that was so cozy. It was really cozy. It got really hot really quick, which is yeah. it was like so nice like when you're cold to get close to the fire. Oh, yeah. And, and that could kind of help on the heat bill. Yeah. It's more like a fun thing to do here mm-hmm. and there. Like it's kind of like, oh, fun and cozy. But it's nice that we don't have to rely on that as our main source yeah. of heat because then I'd probably be like complaining about it and yeah be like, oh my word it's such a pain to like uh, yeah but it's really nice it's really fun well I'm very happy for you with the whole dishwasher thing I like I I think you'll appreciate it so much more mm-hmm. having like went without one I I have always had one besides when we lived in Haiti I guess I loathe I hate doing the dishes i think that just putting them in the dishwasher is a chore so it probably <laughs> would be good for me to like have to go without so i yeah. just get in the habit yeah. and then i like appreciate but i'm like oh i have to load up the dishwasher yeah. i can't yeah i feel like it probably will make me appreciate it way more because uh-huh. like loading the dishwasher now is like such a relief that i don't have to like hand wash them i mean yeah. there's still stuff you have to hand wash but like just like basic utensils like they won't just add up and add up in the yeah. sink until I do them it's like I'll oh, just stick them in the dishwasher and you bake so much that I'm sure like baking <laughs> you get so many dishes I know that definitely adds on to it okay are you ready to get into it yes I have some notes I'm sure you have some notes about I, I think first we'll talk about a little bit of our experience as being missionaries kids kids. obviously this this is just like our personal experience I don't feel like we speak for every missionaries kid because every situation is different this is just our personal story and we were only there for two years so I I feel like when you think of a missionaries kid they like grew up their entire childhood in a foreign country so this is just like our personal experience from the little taste that we had it was only two years, but I think we could both say that those two years, like, really formed who, part of who we are, and, like... A lot of... I would say it formed a lot of, like, my worldview, and yeah. just my outlook on stuff, a lot in general. Definitely, our lives are changed from yeah. those Yeah, and years. I think even just visiting any different country, even if it's not for two years, like, it will probably leave a big life change, Definitely. or a big impact on your life. I feel like some of the fun memories of it that I, something I had written down was I loved the social life of it. Like we were always around, like it was like our family was there, but we had a lot of different staff there, like guys and girls who weren't married. Um, And there were some Haitians that would be on the mission a lot, just like come down and hang out there. There's a lot of kids there that just literally don't have anything to do. And they just, they need a lot of love poured into their lives. And so they would spend a lot of time just down there hanging out around the mission. Yeah. Um, and I I feel like I miss that so much coming home because I loved always being surrounded by people. That was, and yeah, that was so hard for me it too. It was, and I think, like, obviously for my parents, I feel like it was really hard for them because it was really hard to prioritize family time when you were, like, always, there's always people around, always people who need you to help with this or that. But as a young kid, like, I feel like I loved it. And then coming home, it was, like, 
so boring. Yeah, and it's just, just to me, be with the family at the house. Yeah, yeah. the siblings and mom and dad. Yeah, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we like what drew us to Haiti or yeah. how we even ended up there. Yeah, we had visited um, Haiti for the first time January two thousand and ten. I would have been about eight and you would have been six is that mm-hmm. around that age yeah I was almost seven I so remember yeah. um we our church was doing a mission trip so my family wanted to go thought it'd be a neat experience it ended up being during the Haiti earthquake in 2010 like literally 15 minutes after we landed which is kind of crazy Got out of the airport and we're in the truck yeah and, we were yeah. just driving to the mission and then the earthquake happened That was kind of life-changing to be a part of that. And I think being a part of something so um, kind of traumatizing, but also I would almost say in a good way, like Mm -hmm. especially like probably for our parents. I Mm -hmm. think for us, it was just like super fun and like we were- Oh no, like exciting. Yeah. yeah. But like helping so many people and it felt like God had brought us on that mission trip Mm-hmm. Literally for such a time as that. Like, it mm-hmm. is kind of insane that, like, we didn't know. Th- well, obviously, <laughs> we weren't flying down there to help with the earthquake. But, yeah. of course, after we landed, it happened. And there was, like, tons of teams and people from, like, I think all over the world coming yeah. over to help. And we just so happened to be there. And that completely, like, changed whatever the original plans were yeah. for the team. It was and just setting up clinics everywhere. It's kind of crazy. People. when you th- yeah, so, like, yeah. God knew that that was going to happen. And... He, like, sent us down there at that exact time, and he protected everyone, like, Uh all of us. We were, like, literally, we ride in the back of a truck, and so we're all just kind of, like, exposed to the open air, and we were, like, right in the heart of where it happened in Port-au-Prince, and we could see the walls crumbling. Do you ever think, or I'm just thinking about it right now, I think if I was older, it would be way more traumatizing. I'm kind of surprised I'm not traumatized from that. I have thought about that before, and I maybe part of it was, like, the God I, protecting I, us. I think that because I even think with my parents, they were obviously older and <laughs> I don't hear them talk a lot about like having trauma mm-hmm. from it. And I think that also we had like a lot of people praying for us, like our yeah. church family back at home. I remember they sent us letters mm-hmm. and, um, but there was a lot of traumatizing things to see. I mean, there was like some of the guys had to go into like collapse schools and pull like children and kids yeah. out who and, were basically like collapsed and or was, dead already yeah and there was like we set up um little medical clinics with people who just had like l- you know like really bad infections and stuff that like we couldn't even hardly help them with and you saw that all throughout the town and it's kind of crazy that I feel like I don't have a lot of like long-term trauma no. honestly from seeing all that and I don't remember it really scaring me even mm-hmm. like I remember hearing people wailing because people were dying. Mm-hmm. It stunk. We saw like so much like blood and gory things. It smelled kind of like rotten. Yeah. yeah. It, I just, I really think God protected us. I know. From that and trauma. the older that I am now, or just like right now, you're bringing that up. I'm like, that's kind of crazy that I don't really have any trauma from that. And mm-hmm. I, I definitely know that, that was a way that like God protected us all from that. Cause mm-hmm. that could be something that could really leave a lot of trauma with you. But, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of crazy that, Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a God thing. Yeah, so we visited there. We visited a second time the following year, and then the head of the mission we were with asked my dad if he would go down for a two-year commitment. We didn't know if we'd be there longer than two years, and my parents asked us kids, like, I think they didn't want to do it if none of mm-hmm. us were into it, mm-hmm. and we were like, Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. We thought it sounded so fun. We, our hearts, we had fell like fell and fallen in love with Haiti at that point. I mean, the yeah. first time we went there, I was, I remember I was like so scared to go the yeah. first time. <laughs> I had saw this like, um, we were like preparing to go. I saw this like YouTube video of like these missionaries up in the mountains, and I don't think, I think it was in Haiti, like eating like mud pies. And I was like crying because yeah. I did not want to eat mud pies. <laughs> and we never ate a mud pie when we were no. in Haiti. I don't really know if that's even a thing, maybe no. in some parts. But I was definitely, I think, scared to go at first. But, like, we, our hearts, like, fell in love with Haiti. Like, and they still, like, we still definitely have a special place in our heart for that place. But um, definitely after that first trip. So I think that's why we were all so excited and on, and on board to go and live there for a couple of years. Yeah. So we moved there. And 
I think probably around the six month mark, the homesickness mm-hmm. and the reality really set in. I think when we went on mission trips, it was always so fun and exciting. But then, mm-hmm. and you always went back. Like you didn't. You're always sad to leave, but. Yeah, then it was kind of like, this isn't really a fun trip anymore. This is life, and there's Mm -hmm. a lot of hardships. And I wanted to find my diary because I wrote down some of, like, the hardships. (laughs) I couldn't find the diary that I had written it in. I know that, if I remember correctly, they were all very, like, superficial (laughs) sounding. (laughs) Compared to, like, what our parents are probably going through. But this was just my childlike brain, what I missed. I remember saying I missed... We didn't have air conditioner, so it was just hot all the time. <laughs> we didn't have hot water. I missed my hot showers. Mm-hmm. We had to take cold showers all the time. And I really, really missed my friends the mm-hmm. most because it was really, really hard mm-hmm. to make friends. Um, I, The girls were kind of mean to us. Not the staff girls. This was just like no. the like, girls. Yeah. Like a lot of the Haitian girls. It was. I think it was just really hard because we were... A totally different culture than mm-hmm. them and I think you kind of felt like they were making fun of you a lot and they probably yeah. weren't trying to be mean it was just kind yeah of yeah they kind of like I think they were very mm-hmm. entertained and intrigued yes. by us and yes I think I just wanted to fit in and I just and there's also just the cultural differences it's not at least for me it was not easy to make friends I thought mm-hmm. I would just make friends with all the Haitian girls that was just not the case mm-hmm. and I remember something that like really is stuck in my memory and you might, you probably remember this too. I remember it was like the heart, the thick of the homesickness. Mm-hmm. I was thoroughly, I don't know if I'd say depressed. I was thoroughly sad, homesick, did not love living in Haiti. I remember going, um, talking to you about it and we were like, let's just pray that. I don't remember this. Okay. <laughs> this is just like burned into my memory. Uh-huh. I think this was just such a mm-hmm. big deal to me. I was like, let's pray that, okay, so this would have been maybe around July, and then Mm -hmm. we weren't going to go home until April. For a furlough. Yeah, for a month-long trip. So it was going to be a long time till we went back to Mm -hmm. the States. And I was like, let's pray that something will come up that will make us go back home mm-hmm. for a little bit mm-hmm. that'll just be like but let's also pray that it's not like a bad thing we don't want to pray and then yeah. like somebody dies and we have to go <laughs> home for a funeral I remember yeah. specifically praying God I pray that something like good will happen yeah that like forces us to go home a little yeah, early just for a trip yeah. and literally the next day my our dad calls us in and he was like our cousin was getting baptized and he was like we really feel like we need to go home and witness this mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to go back home to America for a week and we're going to surprise everybody. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember that. that, like, I remember I walked away and I was like, God, like, answered my prayer. Like, a worth- very black and white, like, that's an answer from yeah. God after just praying about that. And like, I think that's why clear. it's, like, stuck in my yeah. memory so much. It's like, when God answers something, like, s- like so directly like that that you know it's from him and I think our whole family needed that it was like we had a week-long trip and it was very refreshing Mm -hmm. just to like go home be with friends Mm -hmm. and be with that support system and then we felt refreshed to come back Mm -hmm. but that's like one memory that I have I feel like I've been you can kind of come in with some of your yeah memories Um, too think of other memories that I had and I will say one thing we had so we had it was really hard to make friends with the girls down there there was one girl Dadu um, who lived at a children's home that um, was part of our mission, but it was just a little bit down the road. But it was such a blessing to have her down there because we um, just became such close and good friends with her. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah. she was a native Haitian from Haiti who had um, had a lot of problems with her leg. So she um, lived at the children's home just for um, a lot of like medical reasons. Yeah. And, and just like... I think her family situation a little yeah, bit too. Yeah, it was yeah, a lot of different reasons I think. Um but it was just she was such a blessing in our mm-hmm. lives and I I honestly like it would have if we if she we wouldn't have had her. She also like knew English so well. She was so easy to talk to. Um I'm just like I feel like our experience would have been a lot different cuz yeah. she was literally like 
our best friend. And she so was. And that is like, that was definitely a blessing from God to like seeing that, like definitely. him giving us her as a friend down and there. And she didn't, um, we didn't, she didn't come into our lives until maybe after that six month period. It was like a little bit later on. And yeah, I feel like I she was, I don't remember when it was, but she was kind of an answer to prayer too, yeah. because we had a hard time making friends and she was kind of like helped us get into the Haitian culture a little mm-hmm. bit and like introduce us to her friends. Mm-hmm. And I agree that. Yeah. Just having a, a big friend. blessing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was also really fun. The staff that we did live with, a lot of people were from Canada, actually, and then from other different areas around America. They became like family because we kind of almost like called them like our big sisters and our big brothers. Um, it was just people you lived with all the time. Like every day, you see them every day. We ate a lot of probably most of our meals together with them. And yeah. so they just kind of, you all kind of become one big family and you get super close and I, that was just so much fun. Yeah. I feel like having big sisters like that. And, Definitely. Um, so it was just really fun having those girls there. And there was um, some guys there, too, who were, like, brothers to us. And yeah. it was just, yeah. Definitely. It's really fun um, getting close to them. And I feel like still now when we see them, it's really special. It is. I think some of the reasons that I loved it were also some of the reasons that we like ended up leaving Haiti I loved the yeah like you said the social aspect of it we were with people all the time and I don't think that I ever felt when I was younger that oh I need to like we need family time that I need to be with my parents (laughs) but that was kind of the reason one of the reasons that we ended up then leaving and not staying once the term was over Mm -hmm. I think our family my parents felt like we needed to be together as a family. And at the time, I was like, I do not need family time. Like, I did not. And looking <laughs> oh, back now. Oh, dad. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather just be with other people. <laughs> looking back now, I can understand the reasons why, like, we left. And also, like, I'm really glad that we did move back when we did because mm-hmm. I feel like it was a really good time of life. I think I was maybe 11 when we moved back. So I felt like when I got back, it was still really easy to make friends. It was like at an age where it wasn't like we came home and like everyone else had moved on with mm-hmm. their life and had their like lifelong friends. And then here we were. It was just a good time in life, I think, to kind of migrate back into America, which was really hard. It's a very yeah. big culture change to come back from. Yeah, I a third world country back into the lifestyle of America. I do want to talk about that. I think that is one thing as a missionary and like bringing your kids into the mission field. It's so good, but it is so hard. Mm -hmm. Moving to Haiti was so hard, like so hard adjusting. You have a lot of just like cultural differences and a lot of homesickness, but I think moving back to America was even harder. I think definitely. It's a lot like more on your mental. Like, yeah, it takes yeah. a lot bigger toll on you mentally. And this is kind of like where you're probably going to spend most of your time. So it's like just mm-hmm. the whole lifestyle change is really hard. Yeah. I don't know. I had a a very hard time moving back. I don't know if part of it was like I was 13. So it was a very pivotal time in my Mm -hmm. life and I would like classify moving back as like like one of my like top three or four like most just hard times in your life yeah Yeah. one of the hardest times of my life Mm -hmm. I was a a very struggling girl when I came back Mm -hmm. I I think I didn't realize it, but my relationship with my parents was strained because of that, even though Mm I didn't think it was because I just didn't realize it because I was just Mm -hmm. having so much fun without Mm -hmm. them and without being around them Mm -hmm. as much. And also just trying to adjust to being with American kids who I felt like didn't understand where I was coming from or had just been through for two years some of them have never yeah never even been to a third world country Mm -hmm. and they don't understand and it's not their fault Mm -hmm. but it took me a little bit to adjust and I remember I didn't under I was like why did we move back Haiti was my home that's where Mm -hmm. I belong and now I understand and I think it was the best thing for our family Mm -hmm. I think the two years there was the best thing for our family Mm -hmm. personally but I think moving back was 
the best thing for mm-hmm. our family as well. And then I kind of want to take about talk about a little bit of like takeaways, I guess. And one thing I had written down um, was I feel like for me it has changed my outlook on mission so much and given me like such a huge passion for it. And I don't think I would have had that had I not ever had that experience. And I feel like obviously it's such a special spot in our Haiti, in our heart for Haiti and just for missions in general. I think it just, I don't know, it kind of puts your life into perspective a little bit going on a different trip like that. It's just kind of like realizing that obviously our lives are not our own like God has put us on this earth for a reason and Mm -hmm. to glorify him and you know serve him and spread you know his word and the good news and it's just kind of crazy like I think some of going to a different country and missions is not just overseas in different countries but it kind of like I don't know it feels different it kind of like kind of completely forces you to rely on God and like Mm -hmm. realize that you are literally only in this spot because you kind of followed a call of God because it's not like when you're just at home in your normal life, you know, in America, it's easy just to get like, I guess stuck in the mundane way of living. And when you do like go overseas on a different mission, it's like you are solely there because God has called you there. And like, you are just kind of following his steps for Mm -hmm. you at that point, like in, you know, following his call, especially if you have, you know, felt the call to go to a certain place and obeyed that call. Um, I don't know if I worded that super good. I feel like yeah, I got, especially if you're going longer term uh-huh. as a missionary, you're giving up so much, mm-hmm. and so it feels like a lot, a lot bigger of a sacrifice sometimes. Yeah, and I'm not saying that it's any better to do that than doing missions at here and at mm-hmm. home, but I think it doing that really forces you to get out of your comfort zone and like. I think it forces you to like completely rely on God and it's definitely out of your comfort zone, but it's just like, it's crazy the way that your life can change through that and how you can be blessed so much. And I don't know, I think it's just a really, really cool experience and yeah. just, just amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's so much that happens in a third, third world country too. Even something I've noticed in my own life is having a lack of stability and comfort from our own like a lot of money just because we make a lot of money you Mm -hmm. being out of your comfort zone forces you to rely on the grace of God a Mm -hmm. lot that can be here in America too if I ever think like man we're gonna struggle with money or Mm -hmm. something it's like let's use that as a blessing because that is going to force me to rely on God's mm-hmm. grace instead of me feeling like I can take care of myself all mm-hmm. on my own. And I think that missionaries in third world countries have that as a blessing in disguise of mm-hmm. they have that experience of having to rely on God mm-hmm. that I don't always have because I can take care of myself, mm-hmm. quote unquote. When I have my job mm-hmm. and living in America, I think we we don't have to pray for God to meet our daily needs Mm -hmm. of even just putting a meal on the table or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I've thought about that some when I worry about our future money. I always like to have lots of stability to have all of my ducks Mm -hmm. in a row. And I think, what if God calls us even to leave the country Am I willing to give up the American dream, the American lifestyle, the opportunities that you could have? Here yeah, and to have a nicer house and nicer more car. Money. Yeah, it's, it's a so, big sacrifice. And even I have noticed living here, I it's so easy to get sucked back into mm-hmm. the American dream. Oh, for sure, for sure. Like I wish that I could say that living in Haiti, I just don't because I have that experience. Mm-hmm. I just nope. I don't really care about money. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I yeah. still I still struggle with, you know, the love of money. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's something I've been thinking about a lot of like if I don't have all everything that I need, um, that's that could be a blessing in disguise. Mm-hmm. Think of how much I could rely on God's mm-hmm. grace. Easier said than done, but yeah. I think that that is such a blessing that missionaries have who are actually in third world countries. And to kind of end on the thought of living in Haiti, just um, want to ask you guys, Haiti is going through a lot of hard stuff right now. Um, The whole country is 
kind of it, it's been going on for a couple of years, but I think it seems just to be getting worse and worse and worse with the political things going on there and just the safety and well-being of like all the Haitians down there. So definitely keep them in your prayers um, and just pray for the people of Haiti because I know it's really, really hard on them right now. And um, even some of the missionaries who are still down there, it's just it's kind of a dangerous spot to be right now. Mm-hmm. And so um, if you could just, you know, if you think about it, pray for them because um, they definitely need it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we're going to go into a little bit of kind of talking about our thoughts on short-term mission trips. I recently went on one two summers ago, um, last year. I went to Kenya for a month. And um, so I think um, short-term mission trips can kind of be controversial sometime. Yeah. um, If they're actually helpful or if they're harmful. I feel like I have a perspective on it since I did go on one last year. Just the first thing is you definitely want to make sure that you go with an organization that you trust. And um, I really appreciate with the organization that I went with. I went with Love Africa Mission. They work a lot with the local um, ministries that are going on around there that like a lot of the Kenyans have started. So I think it's really cool that it's, they like we go down there and then we work locally with different missions that are already mm-hmm. established there and kind of help them and bless them in different ways. Um, that's one thought I have on it. I guess we can kind of go back and forth on it. Were you going to share your thoughts on it first? Yeah. I, like you said, um, I think short term mission trips can be controversial. Mm-hmm. I always thought that they were like the best thing ever. Everybody should go on one. Mm-hmm. And I think recently kind of I started to struggle a little bit with it mm-hmm. and I didn't know if these struggles were valid I guess mm-hmm. or not my thoughts of what's even the point I think mm-hmm. we leave our comfortable lives for two, two weeks. weeks and we get on this like emotional high of feeling like feel good feel we're yeah. helping the people mm-hmm. go paint orphanages and take pictures with all of these orphans that have had enough separation in their lives and we like shower them with all of this love and then we leave We're gone. <laughs> we leave we go back yeah. to our comfortable life forget about them forget and we just have that like feel good experience but they're still left with that hardship mm-hmm. and sometimes I think I was like what's even the point point?" and I think I would see people going on mission trips and almost have like a negative view of like mm-hmm. kind of like almost cringing I was like this you got your pictures you posted your cute cute moments yeah you're headed home and you feel good yeah Yeah, I can see having that view too I think the Lord has convicted me on it a Uh little bit to see the good in it and I think it's good to um think about these Mm -hmm. things but I I see a lot of good in Mm short-term mission trips but I think it's also good to know Mm -hmm. the reality Uh uh-huh um, the biggest thing I would say first is to pray about it, which it's easy, easier said than done. I guess it's easy to pray about it, but it's really hard to know sometimes what the Lord is actually telling you to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like also it's kind of like, see where your heart's at. You know, if your heart is in it because you really like feel this call from the Lord that you should go out and do this, or if you're just like, oh, it sounds really fun to go to a different country. And like, I don't know. I think it, it definitely I, d- I think definitely you should feel the call from the Lord to go. Um, something really amazing that happened for me was, um, and of course leading up to it, you've had these doubts from the devil. They're like, did I do the right thing? Mm-hmm. Or even when you're down there, you know, I feel like Satan is trying a lot of things to attack you and tear you down and bring you down. So one really clear sign that God showed me and um, I feel like with such confirmation when I was down there that, like it was kind of a miracle, I guess, from God that I was able to be down there. And I was so glad that God had given me the sign so that when I was down there, I wasn't like overthinking it. Like, was I supposed to be down here? I was like, God brought me here and I don't mm-hmm. need to be questioning, doubting this. Um, one thing was, and this might be a little bit controversial, I guess. I'm not judging you if you have got the COVID vaccine or if you haven't, like it's totally up to yeah, you. Yeah, personal know, decision. Personal decision. But I personally did not want to do that. And but you had to get one to go to Kenya. And so I was trying to get a medical exemption from it because I really, I just did not want to get the vaccine for you know different personal reasons, different, different health reasons. And I don't even remember how I got one. I know I went, oh, so I went to this like more natural doctor and she was like, 
well, I don't really have anything I can write you up for. I forget what the whole situation was. Basically, I started like bawling in the doctor's office. Yeah. I had been so stressed about this whole situation, what I was supposed to do. And she was like, you might get all the way to Kenya and then they're going to look at it and they're going to send you all the way back home. I think you were getting a lot of pressure on both sides. It was during it, during the thick of when like the vaccine some people were was, were like, get it. And some people, people were, were like, like, it is from the devil. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. So there it were, was pretty scary. I <laughs> I was so stressed. Anyway, she wrote me one, and I was in contact with someone that was on the board for Love Africa Mission, and she's like, yeah, that exemption looks good. I think that um, the exemption was something super simple, like Jayla is like a young girl who like studies have shown or whatever that this can be, you know, have some bad results. Anyway, and by, by the way, they check it at the U.S. They don't check it once you get to Kenya and then send you back home. Yeah. It was like they checked it at the U.S. If I'm good at the U.S., I'm going to be good in Kenya. And when I got there, I met some of the other people at the team. Some other people also hadn't got the vaccine and had these medical exemptions. And I was so nervous about it. I was like, I may not be able to go. And, like, I literally have no idea if this is going to work until I literally get there. Mm-hmm. At the, I've already got all my tickets booked. And they passed me. They went through it. Like, they barely even looked at it. And I feel like when I was in Kenya and I was struggling some with just – I know these were from the devil. The devil put a lot of doubts into my mind. Like, oh, you're not really actually doing anything down mm-hmm. here. Like, it, the team would have went on without you had you not come. Like, you didn't make that big of a difference. I was like, it was kind of a miracle in my eyes that, like, God brought me here. And, like, mm-hmm. I feel like God put that in my life. Because when I had originally signed up to go in Kenya, that wasn't even an issue. You didn't have to get the vaccine. And I was kind of like, God put that situation in my life that stressed me out so much. But it was like kind of a like it was confirmation when I was in Kenya that like I thought maybe I wasn't even gonna be able to go but like he just let me pass through like I didn't Mm -hmm. know if yeah like I said I didn't know if I was even gonna be able to pass through with that like medical (laughs) exemption card it might seem like a really small little detail and not make sense to a lot of people but to me I was like wow god like that was literally like I feel like the, fa- the fact that I was able to get through was kind of like a sign that I was supposed to go. Mm-hmm. So that was one really cool thing that, like, was super special to me. Since I am an overthinker, I was like, God wanted me here. Yeah. Um, I think that you saying that you have a lot of thoughts of the devil, I think that's another thing that you should be aware of going into a mission definitely. trip. Is the, especially with Haiti, probably Kenya, I think really doing any any of the Lord's work. But I, I just notice a lot when I went to Haiti personally, is you are going to have spiritual warfare. 100%. I think I felt it so much down in Kenya for a month, Mm -hmm. more than I ever have. Just doubts. Yeah. But I I think if you shift your perspective, one thing is, is like, if you feel like the devil is like really working on you, working on you, you must be doing something right. Yeah, definitely. You have the word of God. You have the tools as a Christian. But I think it is important to be kind of prepared mm-hmm. and to have your guard up mm-hmm. and to realize the devil. And you might have to verbally, mm-hmm. you know, um, denounce Get behind him. me, yeah. Satan. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think Haiti taught us some of that. Mm-hmm. Even as a young child, I don't think we experienced nearly what our parents did I think I experienced it more going back Mm -hmm. older as an older person I felt sometimes like the struggles that I already have Mm -hmm. are like just amplified yes amplified so much and your sin just it's almost like it comes under a microscope Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to describe Mm -hmm. it but I think that's why I probably felt it more in Kenya because obviously when I went to Kenya I was like 19 so I felt like I was a lot older than I was when I lived in Haiti, so I just, I was more aware of everything. Um, another really cool thing about short-term mission trips is, I mean, you help the people there, but also one thing that I, a big takeaway for me was, so I went with a mission group. It was a Christian organization, but there was a lot of different Christians there that were from different denominations, different backgrounds, had maybe a little bit different views than me. And I just, I would encourage anyone, it is so good for you to get with other believers who did not come from the same background Mm -hmm. as you, maybe not the same denomination as you, and that might make you uncomfortable, but it's pretty life-changing. It really helps you see the body of Christ work in a lot of different people's lives who aren't people that are just like you. Mm -hmm. Um, You see the Lord working in 
so many different people who are all part of the same faith as you, but they just maybe were, you know, raised a little bit different or their church doesn't do things exactly like you do, but they still have that same solid foundation of God. And Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, that was really, really good for me. Sometimes it was a little bit hard because it was like maybe someone had a different view than me that kind of made me be like, um, just something I wasn't used to, you know, but it's really good for you because you really have really good talks, you know, and you look into the word together. And um, I don't know. I think it's, it's, I just think anyone in general, it's so good to get with other people, especially um, other believers who maybe are just, we're just raised different than you and just dive into the word together and talk about your different views. And you both just grow so much from that. That was a really beneficial thing for me. There's so much to learn with getting out of your mm-hmm. box. I, the impacts, I agree. I mean, even going on a mission trip, you know, maybe the reason God sent you on that was to help a certain person on your team. Maybe it wasn't even to help the people in this country. Like, you have no idea the reasons exactly why God always sends you, but to serve him. But I remember thinking that, like, maybe my purpose here was to encourage my teammates because we were mm-hmm. all going through a lot of hard things. We had a lot of spiritual warfare. A lot of things were being brought up for a lot of people. Um, and it's like, it was just so beautiful the way that we could all come together and none of us knew each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we just kind of heard of each other because we knew we were going on the trip together, but like all of a sudden you just become so close and um, you are all just relying on the same God. And it was just, that was such a beautiful and amazing experience. And I think that's a huge thing with mission trips too. Just like, I don't know, there's a lot to it more than just like, going to a different country just to serve these people it's like you are also just like serving each other and it's just a really cool experience all the way around yeah I think that's something that the Lord has kind of um, brought to me as I was kind of going through these struggles Mm of what's even the point of mission Mm -hmm. trips is you don't always know why God brought you on this mission Mm -hmm. trip and honestly I think sometimes it can even be to change your life maybe more than exactly. the oh, people's for life. sure. I think th- I feel like that <laughs> yeah. happens mostly anyways. Yeah. Just expanding your worldview, giving you a heart for the gospel, a heart for missions, and mm-hmm. you kind of gain a little bit of knowledge and experience that mm-hmm. you can bring back home. And I think no matter what, your life is going to be changed. Mm -hmm. It's, you can see pictures of people going on mission trips. It's just not the same Mm -hmm. as when you go and and you Mm -hmm. experience it firsthand and feel the Lord's work firsthand. And you also really have to trust God and leave it in God's hands. I know a lot of people, I think I, it was a little bit better for me leaving since I had been on a mission before. So I had had experience, a little bit more experience than some of those people because I had lived two years in a different country and, Um, with a different culture some people really struggled with leaving like you know you get really close to these kids we spent some time at an um a school for 10 days and that had a lot of I don't think not I don't think all the kids were orphans it was just a lot of different kids from around the area and you know you build really strong relationships with them and then you have to leave and some people felt so much guilt from that which is valid I understand feeling that and um But I feel like one thing you have to realize, I don't know, one thing I tried to encourage my teammates with was like, you made an impact on these kids' life. And even if you were there for two years, it would still hurt so much to leave. And Mm -hmm. you're there for 10 days and it still hurts so much to leave. Like either way, it's really hard to leave these kids and you're going to leave them eventually. But you have to trust what the Lord has brought you there to do. And like Mm -hmm. you have, you don't know what you have, you know, the seeds that you have planted in their lives, the things that you have said to them. Even just something like really encouraging, like maybe telling like a little girl that she was really pretty, like that might be something that like sticks with her the rest of her life. And you can't, I feel like, especially if you have felt the call from God to go, like that's a lot of lies the devil tries to put into your head and guilt and make you feel like you never should have went. And, um, and I'm not, I know there's, I don't think every short term mission trip maybe isn't even good. I don't know. That's, that's, I think a lot of this is between you and the Lord, but I just, I feel like you can experience a lot of these doubts and you just have to know that like God brought you there for a reason and you planted some seeds and you may not even see how they grow. But like at that point you have followed your call and like that's in the Lord's hands and now you're moving on to the next chapter of your life. Like yeah, we're the next place God's going to call yeah. you. Um, I think it's just like living our lives with open hands of 
okay, you brought me here. Mm-hmm. What's next? And and I think, like I said, I think there is some short-term mission trips. They probably do do it wrong, but it's kind of not up to me to judge them. Yeah. Like, that is between, I don't know, I'm trying to guess, clarify what I said earlier. Like, I don't want to seem like I'm judging other short-term mission trips because I'm sure people judge everyone's different ways of doing their, you know, mission trip and the things, the ways that they do it. But ultimately, it's between them and God and, like, your relationship with God. I just, if you do go on one, um, I really encourage you to be in the word with God, be in tune with him and um, really seek out what he's calling you to do. Yeah. Okay. I think we need, we're kind of running out of time. I feel like this is something I could talk about for hours. We were like, <laughs> this is going to be a short episode. <laughs> I, I want to give out. And I want to, I want to say, um, <laughs> If anyone has any more questions about this, I love talking about this. You can even reach out to me or Kinsley, but I, especially about if you have a short-term mission trip thing, um, he can say we have two more minutes. Just, I would love. Oh, make this. Oh, make this a two-part. Make a part two. If, if, yeah, if you want to, I would. And I, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, if you ever have any questions about it or just want some advice or want to ask more. Yeah. Any, any questions, um, you can DM me, you can message kinsley even um but i would just i would yeah. love to talk to or you talk about to her message our podcast we'll have all of our instagrams in yeah, the description yeah so i just do not ever feel shy or anything like i would i would love to talk to you about it before wrap it up, to wrap it up <laughs> i want to read a couple of scriptures about being a missionary and our missionary. calling is not overseas it's not always going to be overseas in different countries it is so much I feel like this topic was just really talking about overseas missions we could do a whole other episode just talking about missions around here but I feel like overseas missions is just something I've had in my life more so I'm pretty passionate about it but I would love to get more involved um, locally in ministries and ministering to others yeah okay so we all know this verse but I just want to kind of bring it back to God's word and I have two verses to read Um, Just to kind of that talk about us being missionaries. This is the Great Commission. We all know this verse probably. It's the most common one when you think of missionaries. But this was the last calling that Jesus said on earth to his disciples. And I think it's because it's so important. This feels like it's the call to all of us. Mm -hmm. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Making disciples is, yeah, not only just teaching the gospel, but standing alongside those people. I know in short-term missions it's not always possible, but that's like very true here in America, just with those relationships that we make. And I'll read one other verse that I like. Romans ten fourteen. It's my favorite book of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. I Romans, love Romans. Oh. It's full of gold. Yes. <laughs> Romans ten fourteen. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they verse. to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? It's like so convicting. It's, it's almost so making convicting. me emotional. Oh, I know. That verse. <laughs> something about that verse every time I read it is just like, boom like yeah it's like black and white like it's just so clear what God's calling us to do but it's something that we so easily in my life too like I am so bad at it too it's just something that I want to get better at and um just learn how to be able to be more confident about sharing my faith it's something really hard for me to do um but I really want to get better at that and I'd love just to talk more episodes about. Yeah, that. It's oh, something I could talk forever. I something <laughs> I something I'm so passionate about, yet I fail so much at. So yeah. like, I can talk all day about like I need to be doing this. I'm yeah. so passionate about this, but like at the end of the day, I'm so bad at doing it. But I, oh, uh, I feel like God has given me this passion about it, and like when I get started talking about it, I am just like I could talk for about it for hours. So yeah, I think both of us. When we think about what our mission is right now, our number one mission is our husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Which that sounds like it's funny, but I have to think. Well, if you have kids, it's your family. Your yeah, that obviously comes first. And I think let's keep what if you're single, 
you have so much more opportunity. Definitely. But definitely. I think I have to remember that's my number one mission. Um, but it, you got to have a strong, you know, you are one with your husband. So you got to have a strong foundation and then. Yeah. And I think yeah. it does <laughs> then go beyond that. Um, I wrote down <laughs> a couple things. I said, I don't think. My hand looks so awkward here. <laughs> Oh, (laughs) (laughs) I would say I was thinking not all of us are called to be speakers. I've always been like um, insecure. Like, I don't feel like I'm very good with words. But then I was like, I literally started a podcast, so can't really use that as an excuse. But um, sometimes it is speaking and sometimes it's like going up to people and talking to people. Sometimes it is behind the scenes work that is never going to be recognized. Giving a meal to someone in need, reaching out to someone who doesn't have a friend, or even just being a prayer warrior. Yeah, a lot of things we might never be recognized for, but we will be in heaven. And the point, obviously, we know is not (laughs) to be recognized. Yeah, all these things you can do in quiet and in secret um, between you and the Lord. And it's like God can use literally everything like those are just really great examples of everyday things that we can do and they're so easy to forget even just being a prayer warrior like I feel like I'm so lazy about praying for other people except when I have a really bad situation in my life it's like, yeah please <laughs> yes and it's like on my knees and prayer yeah. for this but it's like yeah. I think it's really easy just to be lousy about it yeah. um until something bad comes up in your life but it's just there's there's a lot of practical easy yeah. ways that you can be a missionary I'll give just a couple practical ones um one thing that we've talked about and we might get into in a future episode but it's sharing your testimony it kind of feels vulnerable and scary but it's so important it's praying with a stranger also vulnerable and scary but and not even praying with a, like praying with a stranger is really cool too but even someone that you may know yeah that, like you're friends with but you like have never just been like hey how can I pray for you like that can Definitely. be such an encouragement to someone and especially for someone that God has laid on your heart like they might be like how did you know like to pray for me right now mm-hmm. I'm really actually going through something yeah listening to that call of the Holy yeah. Spirit it might be like sharing the gospel with the cashier just like kind of finding a way to mm-hmm. you know in your Those seem conversation really scary. I'm so bad at doing that yeah but I think that we should leave with a little bit of a challenge to this week or like this month. Um, Just being a missionary in our own communities, finding just maybe one challenge of ourselves. Maybe it's something that we can pray about, like something that the Lord lays on our heart. But just being intentional, sometimes that's just what it takes is like, oh, definitely. Actually, just praying and being like, God put something on my heart. So Mm -hmm. I want to challenge myself. I want to challenge you and like all of you listening. To just do, yeah. Try to find ways. Be there a missionary. Are so many ways. It's not even. I think we overthink it a lot too, mm-hmm. and it's like we kind of come up with excuses a lot for <coughs> easy ways to be like, "Well, I'm not very good at that, so I'm not going to do that." But it's honestly, like we all know, the gospel message is so simple. Yeah, and that's. I feel like that's a lot how we should look at ministry too. Like, um, the message of God is so simple, but why are we so like? scared and shy and timid to share it i don't yeah. know okay you guys this episode has gotten so <laughs> long thank you so much for watching this feels like a complete shift from our last one <laughs> got a little bit more serious but like we said we want to like keep it fun have but a good also, little mix of both yeah i really hope that you enjoyed this be sure to follow our instagram at sister sit podcast and i will have our individual instagrams as well and we love any feedback from you good or bad so yeah <laughs> definitely yeah definitely appreciate it so That's all for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.